Hello internet and welcome back to the most inquisitive channel on YouTube, Life's Biggest Questions. We dive back into the archives of the SCP Foundation and curiously ask the question, what if SCP-2662 was real? As a citizen of Relay, are you eligible to run for president? <laughs> While SCP-2662 may fall into the remit of comedy, it also poses a pretty interesting concept by germinating issue of consent when applied to fanatic cultism. Much like with Beatlemania throughout the 1960s where John Lennon tongue in cheek claimed that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus and the world bore witness to intense levels of hysteria and a mass high pitched onslaught of screaming, when an idol is coveted to absolution, the recipient is well within their rights to kind of get sick and tired with the whole debacle. I mean, I can only speak on my own behalf, but I'd imagine that intense levels of worship could get pretty tiresome after a while. Look, you've got it all wrong. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anybody. Well, let's zone in on one writhing tentacle of a young man and imagine that somewhere tucked away in the confines of the SCP Foundation is one of the most coercive and maddeningly mentally attractive anomalous entities of all time, SCP-2662 aka Young Cthulhu, and he just wants everyone to leave him alone. As the record states, SCP-2662 is a key to class cognito hazardous entity, approximately 4 meters in height and 200 kilograms in weight. SCP-2662 appears to be in a vaguely humanoid shape with approximately 20 additional muscular hydrostats in similar structure to cephalopod limbs attached to its back. These limbs are fully functional and allow 2662 to perform up to 10 different tasks at once, which in actual fact is a question that I've always wanted to have answered because in all reality Cthulhu would be one hell of a sous chef. The main function of keeping SCP-2662 contained is the prevention of unauthorized entry into its containment unit. See, Unlike most anomalous entities in the foundation, 2662 actually voluntarily gave himself up for containment because he was sick and tired of spontaneously creating fanatic cults wherever he went. For this purpose, on site Task Force Tau 9, codenamed Belligerent Bodyguards, have been organised to guard the containment unit and keep track of new religious followings focusing on Young Cthulhu's worship. Task Force Tau 9 has been authorised to use lethal force if necessary, and all members of the task force are to be tested biannually for cognitive hazardous influence, as in, yeah, SCP-2662 is really effective at inadvertently mentally corrupting individuals to do its bidding. What do you expect? It's a theme extensively covered throughout gothic horror. The idea of the human mind being irrevocably corrupted after staring too long into the abyss. Like lemmings off of a cliff or swarms of mosquitoes to a bright buzzing shining lantern, in many cases it's human nature to offer oneself to a more powerful, more mentally expansive figure. If SCP-2662 was real, right now in 2019, tucked away in a remote isolated site in North America, you can bet your bottom dollar and every other dollar beneath that, that there would be busloads of purple robed fanatics making their way down highways and byways toward their all powerful saviour Young Cthulhu, singing songs and chanting guttural hymns about how cosmically fantastic their fanaticism for him is. You see, what we're forgetting in this equation is the internet. All it would take is a stray post on some backwater forum claiming that somewhere in the United States was a beautiful, bulbous old god that needed worshippers and the floodgates would open. Just look at flat earthers and they've even got their own convention now for what was essentially a troll post on a conspiracy theorist message board. And while our transient cultist lives would be short lived because Task Force Tau 9 would be pretty busy with the migration patterns of these hordes of fanatics, it would only serve to further perpetuate the reluctant influence of SCP-2662. They would become martyrs for the great old one, though he wouldn't be very happy about it at all. Well. Yet. According to an estimate by Margaret Singer, who was a psychology professor of UC Berkeley between 1964 and 1991, there are up to 5,000 active cults in the United States at any one time. And while this may be quite a controversial figure, as the parameters of what a cult is defined as is tentative at best, the fact remains the same. With such a wide and expansive Western demographic, people are clutching at the ceremonial cloth when it comes to understanding the cosmic idiosyncrasies of existence, and SCP-2662 would be the cream of that crop. But we are forgetting one thing, 
While young Cthulhu may be a reluctant old god now, there's no knowing what maturity will have in store for him. Remember when you were a kid you probably wanted to be an astronaut or a bus driver or a firefighter or something. Right now 2662 just wants to sit around and play video games. He's not in the business for settling down with a cult or orchestrating the bidding of a fanatical lineage for all of eternity. But who knows what the future has in store because as the Beatles once sang, will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 600 million and 64? Because you know, that's probably how old Cthulhu would be. What if SCP-049 was real? Roll the clip. Before we clamber into this painfully constructed new world, we've got to get it out of the way. You know how it is by now, question is. If you're a fan of this video, the SCP Foundation, Terrifying Plague Doctors, or just life's biggest questions in general, then please be a dear and hit that thumbs up button, as well as that subscribe bell, so you can stay up to date with our latest and greatest uploads. Also, make sure to stick around all the way to the end, where we'll be reading out some of your more creative comments from over the past few days. On with the show. As the record states, SCP-049, aka the Plague Doctor, is a Euclid class anomalous entity of humanoid identity, roughly 1.9 meters in height, which bears the appearance of a medieval plague doctor. You know, pointy mask, spooky hood. You get the picture. Curiously though, while SCP-049 appears to be wearing the thick robes and the ceramic mask indicative of the Plague Doctor profession, the garments instead seem to have grown out of SCP-049's body over time and as a result are nearly indistinguishable from whatever form is beneath them. SCP-049 is capable of speech in a variety of languages, though tends to prefer English or medieval French. Yeah, that's a kind of a one-way conversation. On an unknown timeline, the Plague Doctor was discovered during the investigation of several unknown disappearances in the town of Montauban in southern France. During a raid of a local home, investigators found several instances of SCP-049-2, aka the corpses that he skillfully reanimates into shambling undead golems that do his bidding, as well as SCP-49 himself probably lurking in a corner. During the encounter, while law enforcement personnel engaged the hostile 0492 instances, the plague doctor was noted as intensely watching the engagement and taking notes in its journal. You see, the Plague Doctor's whole shtick is that, just like any scientist, he observes and adapts, and that's why potentially he'd be a very terrifying and real adversary if he ever reached his full potential. After his discovery in southern France, SCP-049 willingly entered the Foundation's custody, where he remains to this day, thankfully, working on his cure against what he refers to as the Pestilence. And to cut a long story short, we are the Pestilence by means of our proficiency to die as in the collective we, humanity. And this guy wants to cure us all of death, but not in a good way. Let me explain. Throughout the course of his containment, SCP-049 has only ever shown a desire to work on corpses in an effort to develop his cure for the pestilence, often reanimating the dead into shambling monstrosities. But the thing is though, as he often states on numerous occasions, the scientific process is exactly that a process, and it is rarely perfect right off the bat. But what if it was? So let's slide the time scale a little bit and fast forward to a theoretical timeline where SCP-049 has had the time to develop his cure to near perfection, and instead, in this timeline, instead of shambling monstrosities, we had a different version of the undead. A much more presentable version, shall we say. Something that didn't appear undead at all, but instead appeared exactly like you and I. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I'm talking zombie sleeper agents. Let me explain. You see, the thing that makes SCP-049 so terrifying is that he has a cause. He has one simple function that he will go to great lengths to ensure is carried out. And as we've learned time and time again throughout these series of SCP-based LBQ videos, you can't kill an idea. And in the case of SCP-049, you can't kill death. Because as we all know, what is dead may never die. So picture this, SCP-049 has cured death and at his disposal has a horde of lifelike sentient humans that are highly capable and proficient puppets to carry out his bidding. Would the plague doctor simply stop once he discovered the perfect cure to death? No. Of course he wouldn't, because his work would never be complete unless every life form on the planet 
had been cured of the pestilence. So instead of slinking in the shadows, working away in the confines of the SCP Foundation, 049 would seek to be unleashed on the planet with the vile intention and machination to ensure that death's long reign came to an end. But without death, the undead would be insidious puppets of the Plague Doctor. It wouldn't be heaven or paradise, it would be the literal embodiment of hell on earth, an eternal servitude to SCP-049. Picture a zombie apocalypse, but instead of shambling corpses, picture an organised, regimented global army of the undead, led by Hitler, Stalin and Mussolini all rolled into one. That won't stop until every last man, woman, child, whale, mouse, elephant, everything was suspended for eternity in undeath. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty bleak scenario. Let's thank our lucky stars that the SCP Foundation is just fiction, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. What if SCP-035 was real? Seriously, this one's a spooky one. Roll the clip. <laughs> As you all may know, we've got a direct line from O5 Command to distribute and disseminate hand-picked information from the deep depths of the SCP Foundation in a memetic Russian roulette on who can call our bluff and figure out if we're joking or not. Spoilers, we're not. Or are we? Who knows, because so far the lines of reality have been so blurred that we may or may not have an existential crisis halfway through this video. But as you know, and it's a very big but, SCP-035 may just well change our minds, because that's exactly what it does. Before we slip that terrifying porcelain mask on though, you know the drill by now, question is, if you're a fan of this video, the SCP Foundation, all powerful evil theatre props, or just life's biggest questions in general, then please be a dear and hit that thumbs up button, as well as that subscribe button so you can step to that with our latest and greatest uploads. Also, make sure to stick around all the way to the end where we'll be reading out some of your more humorous comments from over the past few days. On with the show. As the record states, SCP-035 is a key to class entity that appears to be a white porcelain comedy mask, although at times, such as when I was researching this very script, it will, without warning, change to tragedy. In these events, all existing visual records, such as photographs, video footage, and even illustrations, automatically change to reflect its new appearance. It's like having an old childhood photograph of yourself kept away in a scrapbook, yet every time you look at it there's a 50% chance that you'll be laughing or crying in the picture. Ugh, that's creepy, right? Well, believe me, it gets even creepier because although on the surface this skip is just a weird little mask, it's actually one of the most dangerous anomalous entities under the Foundation's containment. It was discovered sometime in the 1800s, locked away in a sealed crypt in an abandoned house in Venice, and since then has proved to be one of the most difficult entities to contain. Why? Well, because it's sentient, eloquent, ferociously intelligent, and possesses boundless ancient knowledge. Oh, and also it has a habit of possessing anything that has a humanoid shape including mannequins, corpses and statues. Wherever it is contained, SCP-035 will slowly begin to convince the nearest humanoid entity to slip its mask on. And then things get really bad, proving to be highly sadistic, prompting most people to commit suicide, while transforming others into near mindless servants with just linguistic persuasion alone. And what we're left with is the most terrifying horror movie monster imaginable. Except in this case, it's real. So let's run a little simulation. Let's say the Foundation never found SCP-035 when they did, and it was still at large, hidden in a sealed crypt in an abandoned house in Venice. Now for its size, Venice was an incredibly popular city by density throughout the 19th century. I mean, it's still there obviously, but things have got a little slimmer as far as population is concerned. All those tourists are making it sink, which is really bad, but forget about that one because it was one of the busiest port cities on the planet throughout the pre-industrial world. And and with that comes a lot of foot traffic. And if you're SCP-035, that means a lot of travelling sailors and merchants to corrupt. You see where I'm going with this? The reason 035 is contained by the Foundation in a steel, iron and lead shielded room while being rotated to a new sealed case every two weeks to waylay its physical and mental corruption is because it's really, really good at corrupting humanity to do its bidding. If it was real and the Foundation had never found it, it would have undoubtedly orchestrated its own secret shadowy organisation to enact its vile machinations against civilization. You see, as the Foundation have paid a high price to find out, 
if you keep 035 under containment, it only serves to make it angry, periodically resulting in mass suicides and homicides at a great cost. But if it was left to its own devices, well, it's a coin toss at best. Let me explain. Because throughout the majority of time spent under containment, the foundation have only seen one side of SCP-035's mask tragedy. They've made it angry because it doesn't want to be kept inside a box. It wants to be free, feeding on the infinite complexities of human consciousness, demonstrating its arcane propensity to use the human mind as its fuel and food source. If we left it to its own devices, not locked away under the foundation's containment, who knows what the result may be. Maybe we'd see the fairer side of 035. Yeah, we'd all be under the influence of an all-powerful entity, but hey, what's the downside to that, eh? Without it being angry, Angry, maybe it'd be able to influence the world with less death, mental psychosis, and the whole blood dripping from the walls kind of vibe. Maybe we'd all be in for a cheery rind full of laughter, joy, and comedic totalitarianism. Everything would be hilarious, and existence would be joyful belly laughter on a daily basis. That sounds great, right? Mm, all right, I guess it's time to let SCP-035 out of the box. What's the worst that could happen? What if SCP-1048 was real? Roll the clip. Oh man, that scene gets me every time. But hold on to your hats because things are about to get a whole lot worse and the PG mild peril of Woody, Buzz and the gang is a pleasant stroll in the park compared to what SCP-1048 would have in store for us. Or should I say you? Because this particular questioning hypothesis is going to be focused around your own personal childhood experience with the demonic cuddly teddy bear. Don't worry, it's just a hypothetical simulation. Like with most things horror fiction, there are several layers of storytelling to the anomalous entity in question. So let's cue the backstory. As the record states, SCP-1048 is a Kita class small teddy bear, approximately 33 centimeters in height. Through testing, composition of the subject revealed that no unusual qualities make it discernible from a non-sapient teddy bear. Strangely enough, the subject is capable of moving on its own accord and can primitively communicate through a small range of gestures. The subject regularly shows affection to individuals in ways found endearing by most people. That's our first red flag, never trust anything that's too nice, except SCP-999 that guy's the greatest. SCP-1048 usually shows affection in the form of a hug to the lower leg. Ah. No, snap out of it. The subject has also been observed dancing, jumping in place, and in two separate events, has even drawn childlike pictures for janitorial staff. All Foundation personnel that have interacted with the subject have responded positively to its affection, even D-Class personnel with normally sociopathic tendencies. It's safe to say he's pretty convincing, but please. Don't let him fool you. Fast forward a little bit and everything was pretty hunky-dory for a while with SCP-1048 free to roam the containment site, making staff giggle with joy and glee. It wasn't until approximately seven months after it was originally secured that the anomalous behavior of SCP-1048 was first observed. It is hypothesized that the subject is able to construct crude replicas of itself using various materials in a process that is yet to be observed directly by Foundation staff. Dr. Carver of Site-24 has suggested that SCP-1048 uses its endearing qualities to lull those around it into a false sense of security, allowing it to collect materials to produce these creations. Currently, ah, oh geez, this is where it gets really bad. Currently, there are three known creations of SCP-1048, individually designated SCP-1048-A, SCP-1048-B, and SCP-1048-C. And if you think that this terrifying trio is anything like the proverbial three little pigs, you'll be tragically mistaken. As the record states, SCP-1048-A resembles a teddy bear similar in size and shape to SCP-1048, but is made entirely out of human is. When confronted, the subject will emit a high-pitched shriek that inflicts intense pain in the eyes and ears of everyone in a 10 meter radius. Ear-like growths will immediately begin to grow on those within 5 meters of the subject, covering their bodies in less than 20 seconds, and every person afflicted with these symptoms will die within 3 minutes. It gets worse though, because SCP-1048-B is a similar teddy bear, nearly identical to the original subject, yet inside is comprised of an unborn fetus. Ah, 
Let's just jump to the final one. SCP-1048-C, a creature composed entirely of rusted metal scraps, which was encountered only once before it was fled from Site-24. The composition of this creature and its material is unknown, but it was observed killing and maiming any and all Site personnel, and at one point, jumped through several people like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, so remember when we were talking about your cute, friendly, fluffy, little childhood companion? Well, switch it out and imagine that it was this guy. Imagine that somewhere down the line, your parents picked up a teddy bear from a yard sale. Unbeknownst to them, it was SCP-1048 in the fluffy flesh. The most terrifying scenario for me though, is that SCP-1048 has never been observed around children, or in this case, a child, you. We know for a fact that the subject is incredibly emotionally manipulative and during a stage of delicate cognitive development it's not outside the realm of possibility that you would become a pawn for SCP-1048 while it created its terrifying Frankenstein army. Poor kid. But the real worrying pending question is exactly why SCP-1048 does what it does. As we scour the Foundation's record, some of you may be aware of SCP-2295, a similar sentient teddy bear who instead seeks to heal people and medically repair them. It's safe to assume then that SCP-1048 is the antithesis to this, and its sole motivation is to destroy. If this guy was your cuddly childhood teddy bear, you'd be under the wing of an incredibly powerful and anomalous entity and likely enter a state of extreme emotional and social dependence on the subject. Forget about your parents, your grandparents, your neighbours, your school teacher, your friends. You'd miss it all. But maybe SCP-1048 would keep you around. After all, we've been through a lot together. While it created its army of demonic anomalous teddy bears from increasingly more powerful and terrifying material, set out to destroy whatever it could destroy, you'd be in the background keeping it entertained, aiding to ease stress, build confidence and handle its anxiety. You'd be an integral part of its development, if you were lucky enough, that is. Hey, I guess you could say you'd be its teddy bear. Funny how those things work, isn't it? What if SCP-1440 was real? Roll the clip. Folklore and urban legend are rife with tales about individuals cheating death, daring youngsters and belligerent middle-aged men who felt brave enough to contest the Grim Reaper himself and outwit them in a game of chance. Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm's tale of Godfather Death, the Norwegian tale of the boy with the ale keg, in 1957 Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, and more recently J.K. Rowling's tale of the Deathly Hallows and the Three Wizardly Brothers. In essence, SCP-1440 follows the same story, although along the way, there are a few caveats that make the whole thing a hell of a lot more interesting. But the bigger question is how would our civilization function when faced with a being that could not die? Death is the one certainty that binds us all, and without it, the very fabric of our existence comes into question. As the record states, SCP-1440 is a key to class anomalous entity, taking the appearance of a man of unknown ethnicity and age. When questioned about its name, place or time of birth, SCP-1440 will refuse to answer, although it is a clear if this is due to the subject being unwilling to share this information or simply not possessing it. I guess it kind of gets tiring counting your birthdays for eternity. Although the subject's appearance is that of an octogenarian, in layman's terms a man in his 80s, it has not shown any further signs of aging in the 50 years since first coming to the attention of the foundation. So what's the big deal? An old dude wandering around for eternity minding his own business. Let him go on with it, right? Well, if only it was that simple. The old man's anomalous nature becomes apparent once he comes into contact with human population or man-made objects and remains in contact with them for longer than a few days. In essence, SCP-1440 has an acute adverse effect on everything connected to humanity. Prolonged exposure of any man-made objects or person to 1440 will cause increasingly destructive events to occur in its vicinity until the destruction or death of said human element. The only exception to this are SCP-1440 himself, his clothes and his belongings, a sack made of unidentified material, a pack of warm playing cards, and a small glass cup. Remember those three things because they're kind of very important. But that's the real tragedy of SCP-1440. He's immortal, yet he cannot spend any time with civilization for fear of destroying everyone and everything. And that's where the problem lies, because the planet's population is expanding, and SCP-1440 is running out of places to hide. The old man appears to be aware of his effect on human populations, and will attempt to avoid coming in 
into contact with them whenever possible. Despite these intentions, SCP-1440 is compelled to travel in what seems to be a highly complex pattern, which invariably leads it into contact with human population. The exact nature of this behaviour has yet to be successfully analysed, but its compulsion to gravitate toward large populations has led the old man to seek to be destroyed by the Foundation. He's terrified of his own effect on the planet, and he's running out of places to hide. If he was real, the clock would be rapidly ticking towards a point of no return. The population of our planet is nearing 8 billion people, and save for the barren landscapes of Siberia, the Sahara Desert, Antarctica and the Arctic Circle, there aren't that many geographical oases to seek sanctuary in. So what's the solution then? Because according to the Foundation, they haven't got a clue. But perhaps the solution wouldn't lie in SCP-1440 himself. After all, there's not much you can do after you'd pissed off death and his three brothers. Perhaps then the solution would lie with us, because as the old adage goes, when everyone's a super, no one is. Maybe the way to solve the unsolvable problem of SCP-1440 is to achieve immortality ourselves. Maybe, just maybe, SCP-1440 would be the indicator that we could use to cheat death ourselves. According to leading futurologists such as Ian Pearson, humanity is on course of achieving immortality by the year 2050. Now, this immortality obviously isn't the same means as the way that the old man achieved it, but more in line with technological advancement that allows our species to bring our mortal forms to such scientific proficiency that death no longer becomes a thing. The gene editing tool CRISPR, the ability to regrow and synthetically manufacture organs, and the technology to upload our minds to machines. Hey, it almost sounds like those three belongings that SCP-1440 carries with it, right? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, but SCP-1440 destroys any man-made material around him. And yeah, of course that is the case. But hey, if death actually is a real entity and an entire planet just cheated him through technological means, I'm guessing he'd be willing to give SCP-1440 a bit of a break. After all, what if SCP-017 was real? Roll the clip. Ah, everyone loves Vin Diesel as Riddick, right? But I hate to break it to you, not even he would be safe if SCP-017 got its shadowy tendrils around him. Poof, he'd be dead. As would the rest of us unless we could ensure that humanity had a way to bathe themselves entirely in bright light, which would lead to a much, much different way of life for you and I and everyone else on the planet fortunate enough not to be consumed by the shadow. Or unfortunate enough, it depends which side of the pessimistic fence you're sitting on. Well, strap on your hypothetical thinking caps because we're about to fall through a literal black hole of how to survive in a post SCP-017 world, in the moment that we've all been waiting for, the beacons are lit. As the record states, SCP-017, otherwise known as Shadow Person, is a key to class anomalous entity that very much wants to get out of its box. It is a humanoid figure approximately 80 centimeters in height, anatomically similar to a small child, but with no discernible identifying features. This anomalous entity seems composed of a shadowy smoke-like shroud, and yet, while no attempt has been successful, it remains unknown as to whether there's anything actually beneath its shadowy shroud, or if it's completely comprised of darkness. I mean, I wouldn't really want to be the one to find out, right? If I've learned anything, it's don't go poking a finger at an abyssal cosmic void. Ah, uh, there's a life lesson in that, I think. To keep it under wraps, the foundation goes to great length. But, well, actually, when you say that, it doesn't really. It's kind of the lowest maintenance skip when you boil it all down, and all it takes is a few well-placed flashlights. Let me explain. SCP-017 is contained in an acrylic glass cage, centrally suspended in a concrete room. Attached to the wall, ceiling and floor are high-intensity arc lamp spotlights pointed directly at the acrylic cage to ensure that SCP-017 is constantly exposed to light from every angle. Personnel assigned to the control room are to monitor the functionality of the spotlights and the emergency generator system and call for maintenance immediately upon knowledge of a burnout lamp or an issue with the generator. The only circumstance under which personnel are allowed entrance is to replace lamps. When entering the skip's containment room, they're required to wear a designated full body reflective suit and under no circumstance can step in front of a spotlight because, of course, they'd cast a shadow and to SCP-017, that's a high speed highway to take over the planet. Keep that suit in mind for a minute because it's important and possibly 
our only line of defense in a post apocalyptic SCP 017 world. The only way to answer this question is to envisage a scenario where SCP 017 had enough darkness to break out from its containment. A power cut, which, granted, would take an absolutely catastrophic cock up on the foundation's behalf, but hey, we've got to get this ball rolling somehow, right? And let's make it happen at the worst time imaginable during the dead of night. Within seconds, the spotlights would cut out, and before we know it, the entire containment area for 017 is engulfed in its shadow. Poof, gone. Now, we don't know for certain how quickly this skip would spread, but let's give the foundation the benefit of the doubt and say that they had the foresight to put this particular containment site in a remote location. And so, within minutes, 017 has consumed the entire isolated area. Also, it's the dead of night, so let's say this area is in Washington State, falling under the Pacific time zone, where a dark evening lasts between 9 pm until roughly 4 am. So, for the vast majority of people in the Pacific states, there's a good chance they're tucked up in bed in a nice dark room, ripe for the picking by SCP 017. Poof! Again, millions of people gone without anyone even realizing, becoming part of the darkness back to whence they came. Oh, sorry, got a bit archaic there, but you get the gist, right? The real answer to this question is SCP 017 would spread as quickly across the planet as it takes for one full rotation of the Earth. And if the supporting document SCP 017 1 is anything to go by, pretty much the entire population of Earth would be wiped from existence. Not even dead, they'd just cease to be gone. The slate wiped clean. But what about the survivors? There's got to be survivors, right? Of course. The Earth takes 24 hours to fully rotate across its time zone, so depending on how lucky you are geographically, that's potentially 24 hours to prepare for the shadow. Remember that reflective suit? Yep. Get yourself one of those, and then stand in a large concrete bunker with enough artificial light to make the cosmetic aisle in Macy's look dim. But what then? Build yourself a suit full of heat lamps and roam the wasteland looking for supplies? What about a power source? What do you do when your suit runs out of battery? The world's population has been consumed by shadow and you've got 24 hours to make sure your body never crosses a shadow again. Utilizing infrastructure is going to be pretty low on your list of priorities. <sighs> I hate to be the pessimist in this one, but SCP-017 really is the final goodbye. Eventually, inevitably, we'd all succumb to the void. You know what my girl Joni Mitchell said, you don't know what you've got till it's gone.